Sometimes it's also... Seven o'clock. I'd like to bring the March 26, 2024 Planning Board meeting to order. Karen, if you could take a roll call, please. Carolyn Turner? Here. Mike Ventresca? Here. Jim Callahan? Here. David Edmonds? Here. Claudia Bolgan? Here. Kevin Donovan? Here. Chair Bob Doherty? Here. First thing we have on the agenda is a subdivision approval not required plan for 2224 Waltham Street. Do I have any uh, questions or any statements from the board? So they're basically just shifting the land from one lot to another lot. That's what I see also. But it still meets all the requirements, so I'll make a motion to accept. Dave has made it. A motion to accept the, the uh, approval not required. Um, is there a planning board director recommendation? Yeah. Would, you, would you like one? I, I will give you one. Um, uh, Bob, as you mentioned, this um, this particular A and R plan, it's not an A and R plan, it's a lot line relocation plan. So parcel A, which is on the top of um, lot A2, um, so lot A, parcel A, is being added to former lot A to create new lot A2, and that would consist of 39,038 uh, square feet. And parcel A is being taken away from uh, former uh, lot B, and former lot B will become uh, new lot B2, um, consisting of 39,667 square feet. Uh, no changes are proposed with this plan um, concerning the frontage of either one of the lots. So I would recommend, um, you know, being a lot line relocation plan, um, it would be a favorable plan for the board to consider endorsing. Okay, so we have a recommendation from the director. And Dave, we still have your motion to accept Dave. the director's recommendation? Yes. Okay. Second. Dave, second by Claudia. All those in favor? 7 0 approved. Up next is a subdivision approval not required plan uh, 125 129 Pearl Street. Mr. Chairman, uh, for the record, Attorney James Giuliano, Giuliano Law Group, 607 Main Street, Woburn. Uh, we had a couple of discussions. I would like to withdraw this AR plan for the time being, and we were going to refile this. Uh, there's a few things that we have to uh, address with the plan, and uh, hence it's the request just to withdraw this at this point. Okay. All right, uh, do we need a formal motion? I would say yeah. All right, motion to allow the applicant to withdraw the subdivisional approval not required plan for 125 and 129 Pearl Street. Second. 
Motion made by Claudia to accept the with, uh, withdrawal. Second by Jim. All those in favor? Seven four zero opposed. Up next, subdivision approval not required. Plan for four Crossman Road slash Loves Lane. Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, do I have a recommendation from the director? Um, yes, you do. Um, as with the previous plan, uh, parcel A, consisting of 2,367 square feet, uh, is being added to uh, proposed new lot 1A. And that would consist of 17,600 square feet um, adding parcel A, which originally came from new lot, proposed new lot 2A. And new lot 2A would consist of, with the action of the planning board this evening, uh, 16,928 square feet. And um, both meeting the minimum lot size requirements as well as frontage. Um, as you can see, there's no building shown on, on these particular lots and none is required. So I would recommend uh, that the board endorse this a and plan um, in accordance um, with state statute. And there is a note, and I should have brought this up earlier, there is the uh, requisite note, one of three, uh, below the signature block of the planning board, and that note reads the above Endorsement is not a determination by the planning board as to conformance with zoning requirements. And it is stamped and signed by the, um, the plan's professional um, surveyor, Ed Farrell. Questions? Of me? Nope. Any motions? I'd make a motion to endorse the plan. Approval not required. Motion by Claudia to endorse the plan. Second. Second by Carolyn. All those in favor? 7 0 passes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. It's hard to come across any easier in our plans to deal with. Okay, up next is a public hearing. It's a continued public hearing. <clears throat> on zoning amendments regarding murals. Hello again, everyone. Um, I, my name is Casey Haggerty. I'm the city's economic development manager. I'm coming back to you, I think, continued from our March 12th meeting. Um, since then, we've met, had an initial, uh, we opened our public <coughs> hearing with the city council. That meeting has been continued to April 9th and are working on finding a uh, committee date to discuss that in more detail. But we're back here again um, to give an update to the planning board. Um, since we last met, I have reduced the number of proposed zoning districts that the uh, murals would be allowed in to just the BD. I have an updated uh, zoning table if anyone wants to take a look at it. Um, Karen, can I get Sorry, I should have handed these out before. I'll get them. Motion oh, sorry, up. motion. Oh, so moved, motion to accept. Second. Thank Claudia, you. Second by Mike. All those in favor? Seven zero cap passes. So you'll see that we've uh, made the murals not allowed in all zoning districts except for the BD, which consists of our downtown uh, business district. Good. And I think that will uh, that was to appeal many of the appease many of the comments made about uh, concern about yeah. a butter inter or a butter reactions to murals. Um, another concern that the planning board had specifically was what tools does the building commissioner have to enforce uh, the repair or removal of a mural that falls into disrepair. The building commissioner has the ability to find $300 per day uh, for each day that the mural is found um, out of compliance. That comes directly from the nuisance section of the zoning ordinance, which the building commissioner is uh, tasked with enforcing. Uh, the question also came up about removal of murals. We could add something in about, uh, you know, a your mural, uh, sorry, excuse me, a mural has to be returned to the original state. 
It does raise some issues, you know, if the original state of the wall was something that's in disrepair. Um, it also, you know, we're not, we don't have historic districts within Woburn Center. So there's really nothing stopping the property owner from removing the mural and then painting the wall lime green or hot pink. Like there's nothing stopping them from doing that at all right now. Um, you know, even if we weren't to allow murals, there's nothing stopping them from painting their wall essentially. So I think our, our tools for uh, recommending specific methods for removal of murals are somewhat limited because we don't have that historic district that can really speak to um, you know, the colors and aesthetics of your building. I think those were the, the main concerns I heard from the planning board last week. So I'm happy to answer any questions or provide more feedback. Hey, do we have any questions for Ms. Hagerty? David. So I'm not getting into the First Amendment situation again, but we said we would restrict advertising. Do we restrict political commentary? Because if somebody wanted to put up a artistic work with a of George Washington, I imagine nobody would object. But if it was a more contemporary president, people might object. So would that be okay? My understanding is that would be okay. That you know is protected by the First Amendment. We're very limited as to the types of uh, subject matter that can be. Uh, that can be regulated. So political speech could be on a mural? Yes. Because that's something we really didn't talk about. Yeah. We, we kind of made it sound like there's this benign thing going on where um, as long as they're not advertising the dogs on the wall next to the dog place, um, other images would be okay. So that concerns me. I realize it's free speech, but you know, when I was growing up, they used to have billboards along the highway, and then they realized that that was turning into a, a mess, and so they eliminated them under, I think, Lady Bird Johnson, who was just a historic figure to you, but a contemporary of mine. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I just don't want us to get into a situation where suddenly the downtown or any of these areas with these walls become uh, places for political discourse. And I do hear your concern and I respect that, but I will say that I have reached out to many other communities that have murals and no one really has had issues with political content, offensive content, uh, you know, things that might be distasteful. So I don't want, you know, to jump to the negative when we think about the murals. Like there are a lot of positive aspects as well. Were these communities sort of touchy-feely communities? No, they were all sorts of communities comparable all over the state. You know, you have Lynn Revere, Medford. Um, I'm trying to think who else would be comparable. You know, I mean, Reading uh, allows them. Um, Quincy, Malden, similar, similar makeups. Okay, I'm good. Thank you. Can I ask Claudia? So I'm... Thinking about what we currently have, and my memory of the initial presentation was that what our current zoning, if nothing is done, um, the way that the building inspector interprets murals is as signs and regulates them accordingly with regard to, I would assume, dement, you know, how big they are and, and what sort they can be. Has that ever been challenged? Has his interpretation ever been challenged to your knowledge? Not, not to my knowledge. We had one situation where someone did want to paint a mural um, on the back of Whole Foods. They had a nice mural of lily pads and frogs and kind of a pond scene, and they chose you know, not to challenge the building commissioner based on his determination. Because what I'm, having, having read the First Amendment article that John um, sent around, thank you. It struck me that although the zoning code doesn't currently talk about murals in any, any way, shape, or form, it's still potentially an expression, right? That someone on their private property could say, well, I want to paint lily pads on my dog grooming business, or I want to paint lily pads on my 
grocery store business and then the answer comes back from the building inspector well that is a sign and you need to and if you can't meet those requirements then you can't do it and then the and then the property owner says well my first amendment rights are to express art on my property and decides to sue the city of woburn right i mean that could happen mm -hmm. just so so it struck me when i was thinking about this that well currently we don't allow for murals currently the building inspector interprets someone who wants to paint a mural as a sign and regulates it accordingly um and then you know the question i had is well is that challengeable like if we do nothing and somebody wants to paint a mural and wishes to take it to the legal system right that's that's kind of what i'm thinking we don't we don't we don't regulate it but that doesn't mean that it can't happen the building inspector has a way of dealing with signs but is that challengeable right as a property owner wanting to express themselves on their own property with a mural that they don't feel is appropriate to regulate as a sign and that infringes upon their first amendment right and then they just sue us so that's really not a question but it's more of an observation mm -hmm. that doing nothing also might have a downside if people really do want murals on their property and are willing to take it further than what the building inspector excuse me the building inspector may say or not say as to that proposal i don't purport to have the answer but that is a question that i wanted to ask so thank you i'm set thank you claude anyone else john yeah i just want to point out uh casey and i had that exact conversation today about this so that hasn't happened in the city of woburn where somebody um decides to paint a mural and they've challenged the building inspector about that particular issue. Um, it's been reported that he has been able to stop people from painting murals with the commercial content to them associated with the, the business uh, that the mural was being painted on one of the walls of. So th there's a property up in uh, Central Square that was subject to this not that long ago. So that is an issue that could come up, and then is that the Pandora's box? If we lose that, that case, then it's open season for murals to take place with no regulations. So here's a chance for the city to actually regulate murals, and it's been downsized from the, the last time the board held the public hearing. It's now, as Casey pointed out, it's for the downtown area only. Um, you know, I just want to bring out, and I said this at the public hearing of the city council last week, this all began as a, an exercise in, in good faith. And, you know, everybody thought it was really a good idea, no consequences. But then, as I pointed out later in my presentation to the council, um, you know, First Amendment rights of people do work very strongly into this whole potential of murals. And um, I don't think it's really been tested out fully in the courts yet relative to what a community can actually regulate and not regulate. It, it hasn't risen to the ultimate um, court decision, in, to my knowledge. But what has been recognized with murals is that everyone's First Amendment rights um, are most likely going to be protected um, to the extent that case law exists on one's First Amendment and their right to express within the limits of the law their First Amendment rights. And it's, it is art. It, does it become offensive? Does it become, or does, it, does a mural that an artist is creating fall into those prohibited zones that are well established and haven't been overturned. And I think everybody knows what I'm talking about. You know, the famous saying is that the judge was measuring whether a movie was um, pornographic. Really hard to define, but you know it when you see it. 
and that's pretty much the judgment of something to that effect. So here we're dealing with, you know, a can of worms that hasn't been opened, and do we want to open it? And opening it means do we want to um, adopt a zoning ordinance that, in effect, regulates it? And I think I pointed this out at the board's planning board's meeting the last time we had this. I, this is, I think this really requires, if we're going to go forward with it as a community and take this up, you know, more seriously and in depth and better understand it, it you know, we need to really discuss this and, and research it more and really find an area of knowledge with this subject matter that we really do feel comfortable and well informed to actually make a decision on. You know, and I'm personally not there yet. Um, I, I'm not, I wouldn't speak for anybody on the board, but you may not feel confident yet with the information you have on this that you need more time with it. Um, and the city council may feel that way. I just think that once the final decision is made, we're gonna, we're gonna have to live with it and whatever the results are. I don't think they're gonna be onerous. Uh, you know, we're gonna end up totally regretting it, but the, there may be a situation where a mural is painted on a wall in the city of Woburn that ends up offending half or more than half the population, but there's nothing we we're gonna be able to do with it or do about it. We're just gonna have to live with it and ignore it. Um, you know, last week when I talked in front of the city council, you know, I expressed that I, I really do like artwork, whether it's interior or exterior, but I, I really totally detest graffiti. And I'm never, I don't think I'll ever be persuaded otherwise, um, you know, as nice as it is, because it's not an authorized um, piece of art. So, but do we have to authorize art? You know, but you know, somebody with a few spray cans and, and taking it upon themselves to deface, you know, private property or even public property, and then, you know, it's just, it's one of the worst scars upon our environment that, you know, we, we are all subject to what people with spray cans end up spraying everywhere. And whether it's nice or not, it's not a regulated situation. It's not an authorized situation, but we all end up having to live with it. So it's not fair. You know, in this particular situation, we're trying to regulate something relative to it expressing art. And we hope it's quality art that, you know, is not going to be offensive to people. But you really don't know what the final end result will be when we do have one of the most sacrosanct amendments, you know, the First Amendment, what the rest of the country is based on. That's the, that's the cornerstone of the foundation, in my opinion. That's all. Anyone else? Mike? Uh, this is a tough one. I mean, I love spray paint, John. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but that's just, it's just like, that's exactly what we're talking about. You know, people love it, people hate it kind of thing. You know, this on the surface seems like a, a simple, a nicety that we'd like to see. And I think we're getting, you know, mucked down in the, in the, in the nitty gritty details of the First Amendment. Um, I, I'm not sure how much more we could dissect and bisect this. And, you know, I'm at a point where I'm just ready to kick it to the city council. Sorry, Donnie, but... <laughs> Um, you know, I don't know. We're in a, t a tough spot. I mean, I, I understand in some areas it'll be wonderful. In other areas, in in other, you know, it's just a tough. It's a tough one. It really is. Um, but like I said, I think. I mean, I I kind of like these um, last minute changes that you had done, Casey. Thank you. The only thing I was kind of I want to question though is what you had stated about if we want it to go back to its original form. You said it, it could be painted some obscure, ugly color or something? Yeah, from my understanding, you know, the building commissioner could uh, 
we could put language into the zoning ordinance that says upon removal of, you know, order of removal of a mural, the wall must uh, revert to its original state. And they could, you know, strip the mural and go back to the brick wall. But then there would be no, nothing stopping that same property owner from then painting the wall a different color the next day. Because that's like, just paint. Just like that's not a mural. It's like somebody wants to paint their house. Yeah, exactly. So it's a little bit weak, I think, the tools we would have there. And there's nothing stopping them now from painting it exactly. lime green. Exactly. I mean, yeah. And I will add, too, I mean, I, I keep hearing this theme of, like, losing control of the situation. But in some ways, like Claudia was alluding to now, we kind of have no control now. We're trying to regulate it to maintain some control over the situation. Because, you know, if someone did challenge the building commissioner, or if we get a new building commissioner who has a different interpretation, you know, it might be you know, open season on murals. We're here, we're restricting it to the areas that the city finds appropriate, or deems to find appropriate. Mike, anything else? That's it, thank you. Carolyn? Yes, yeah, so um, I'm actually not in favor of this. Um, as you know, I voted against it back in December. Um, and a couple of things, you know, to Claudia's point tonight, um, while we certainly can have a challenge in um, some type of potential suit against the city of Woburn for constitutional rights, I think um, an ordinance such as this that would allow the murals would actually be more likely to open up a Pandora's box because now we're allowing it, um, whereas in if we were let it to let it be as it is now, I think it's less likely for an individual um, owner to come forward and challenge whether that is a violation of constitutional rights. I think it would be more limited in this situation. And if we were to allow it, um, you know, you have a challenge of constitutional rights, but even more concern, um, you know, with no oversight as to the content. Um, I, I think that as we've talked about at the last meeting, I think everybody probably commented on beauty is in the eye of the beholder and we have some individuals, the owner, that may have a beautiful piece of artwork in his or her eye and then you may have five or six hundred community members um, that don't like that. Um, I think there would be a lot of adversity and my concern again to one person would be beautiful artwork and somebody else could actually raise a religious or political negative or adverse connotation, and that concerns me. Um, I think that our department heads and staff members would do a good job and would be diligent in trying to monitor this. But again, one of the issues that was raised, um, that I raised last time, was enforcement. Um, there can be a $300 fine. Is that gonna be paid? What if it's not paid? What if the building owner sells the property and or we talked about the issue with the landlord um, and a tenant relationship. In that, in that lease agreement, if there's no, we don't have any oversight in that lease agreement in the terms of that agreement, and if they both up and leave and then we have a building that's in disrepair, how is that going to be maintained? And by the time we get to that point in potential litigation, we're looking at an eyesore for one, two, three years. So those are so, some of my concerns, and I'm not in favor of this. But I appreciate your efforts, and <laughs> you're listening to our concerns. Jim. I think I fall on line where the uh, planning director's views were. I'm not totally on board, but I'm not opposed to it either. I think it needs more deliberation. I think this would be a... Uh, type of ordinance that would fit well in a ZORC committee, if there still was one, uh, where both the city council and the planning board and the general public can weigh in offline and come up with a more enhanced proposal to deal with some of these uh, more delicate issues. Thank you, Jim. Okay, this is still a public hearing, so if anybody in the general public would like to come up and speak. Please do. Please state your name and address and sign the 
piece of paper on your way out. Good evening. My name is Rosa DiTucci. I live at 82 Arlington Road in Woburn. And I've been to all of these meetings now, and I learn a little bit more every time. Um, one of the things I would like to say is I do believe that as long as murals are regulated as signs, then I do believe we, that the planning commissioner has the ability to regulate what is on the mural. Once we open up murals in the way that is being discussed here, then there really is very little oversight that, that anyone can have. And um, if I might, I'd like to just hand out a couple of examples of some of the local murals that... Um, motion, motion to accept. Yeah. Oh, let me see. Motion I think I have to accept four. the handout from Claudia. Sorry. All right, I have three. Second by Dave. All those in favor, seven zero. They're all the same. And I apologize that they're not photographic quality. They came off my home printer. <laughs> and you'll have to share. Yeah, we'll share. We'll share. But these are examples of actual murals in some of the, um, the cities that were just mentioned earlier, Lynn, Boston, East Boston. And some of them are from out of state. Some of them are political. There are dueling Obama and Trump murals in the examples. Um, there are some pretty interesting things in here, some that, are, that might even be considered triggering. Um, for instance, my next door neighbor is of Cuban and um, Puerto Rican descent. And she was recently in Cambridge and saw a mural honoring Fidel Castro. And she was highly offended by that, knowing that her parents had to flee Cuba. In, in an attempt to save their lives. So this is the sort of thing that, that does and will show up on our city walls. It's not a maybe, it's not, oh, okay, you know, Woburn is different, so we won't have these, these expressions. We will. And what you're going to see in this packet is a very gritty, it, it's just gritty. It's not Woburn to me. And if we sit here and say, well, you know, it just can't happen here, it will. If you open up the Pandora's box, if you allow this to happen here without any sort of oversight, because we can't, this is what you will get. And we, and you as a body, city council as a body, have spent decades trying to make sure that the integrity of the city remains intact. Its look, its feel, its vibe. We even regulate signs, what color they can be, whether they should have lights, whether they, uh, you know, we regulate all of those things. And now what we're saying is, yep, you do it. We don't know who you are, Mr. Artist, Ms. Ms. Artist. We don't know who you are, property owner. We don't know or really care about your political opinions. Put it up on your building. We're okay with that. And that's really what this is. It's a total abrogation of the responsibility for what our city will look like. And what you have in front of you is what it will ultimately look like because it has happened in these other cities. Now, I called Lexington because Lexington allows murals. And it was really interesting because I thought, what? Lexington? But the secret there is that downtown Lexington is an historic district. They don't allow it in their historic district. They allow it in very specific areas, and it's very well controlled. Some of these other cities, Medford, for instance, just put up a mural, and I have relatives that live in Medford. They drive by it. They hate it. Other people drive by it. They love it. So I guess the question is, what do you see? Woburn becoming. How do you see us if what you see in those examples I just gave you are how you see our city, then I would say, go ahead, approve murals. I don't see it that way. I love my downtown. I really do. I, I go through it and I, I can feel the history. I can feel the people who 
lived here who built those buildings, who used to work at the Woolworths or, or the old downtown theater. And I, and I love it. I, I'm hoping that you choose not to go in this direction because I don't, I don't think it's the right thing. It's, it's just not. And believe me, I'm an art lover. I probably have more original art in my house than the average person. I love art of all kinds, but I also value the beauty that is inherent in our city, in our buildings. And I think about the, the fads that come and go and what is going to happen to our city if we allow this to happen 20 years, 30 years down the road, what she's going to look like. So I'm hoping you'll really consider not allowing this. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Can I, can I make a clarifying point? Yeah. Sure, Kate. I just wanted to clarify, the last speaker mentioned that the city can regulate the color of signs, and that's not something the city can do. The city can regulate the size of a sign, the location of a sign, and lighting, but they can't regulate color, font, logo. I misspoke. What I should have said is lights. Neon lights, you can regulate whether it's a neon light or not a neon light. Thank you. Uh, good evening, members of the planning board, uh, Chairman Doherty, direct, uh, Director Cashel. My name is Jerry Lonis. Um, I reside at 15 Garden Street in Woburn. Uh, I am a lifelong resident. And I'm here tonight to um, share my concerns again with um, basically what you guys are all concerned with, um, what uh, Ms. Tucci is concerned with. Um, I've been really pleased with the, um, the way the city has progressed in terms of signage and um, facades improvements in the downtown area. Uh, so I'm concerned that the addition of um, murals will sort of sidetrack the direction that we've gone and it will create the look um, that we've that will go back to the look of a sort of a mishmashed downtown. Um, I believe that without clear regulation, and I had put down um, content, which I understand now um, can't be um, regulated, um, but the size and the color scheme and the volume of murals um, will lose the generally simple but tasteful uniformity that we are beginning to experience in the downtown. Um, I do believe that murals certainly have a place in this society. Um, I believe that um, there should be places for artists to create them and for those who um, wish to enjoy them. Um, I don't really have any solutions other than uh, if it would be possible to possibly create a mural park somewhere. Um, I'm not sure that that can be done, um, but I, I believe that um, if we move um, murals from signage, I think that we open up um, a bad place and I think that um, if we don't consider them signs, then we're, we're going to open it up to um, anybody, a private citizen or a private business, to be allowed to, to put a mural on and I don't know if we can um, prevent that. So thanks for your indulgence this evening, I appreciate it. Anyone else? The audience would like to speak on this. Thank you, Darlene Mercer Bruin, 22 Richard Circle, Woburn City Council. This is not why I came down to this meeting, um, but I want to thank you all for your compelling debate because that's what drew me back up here. Um, and it is an ordinance change, so it's, I think it's okay for me to comment. Um, I thought when we were debating this on the council, if it were contained or we chose a particular area, um, that that would solve our problem. After hearing some of the debate tonight, I'm more concerned um, than I was before. <laughs> Um, having a particular area, I think, will open it up 
to the kinds of challenges that Director Cashel mentioned earlier from other parts of the city, as um, Ms. Turner pointed out. I'm very concerned about that. But as I was thinking about this, I think it all started, and Casey has done amazing, an amazing job with this. I know it started with one or two business owners who were trying to do something, and it morphed into this, what it was, and now back to where we are tonight. I think there's probably a much simpler solution working with the building department and using our sign ordinance in such a way to get the business owners what they need without opening up this Pandora's box. Um, and that just occurred to me now. And, and I also, um, I don't know if there's a way to limit the number of them. I know we limit certain things uh, through special permit. Um, how many certain, like we limit storage um, facilities in the city and we, um, I don't know if there's a way that we can do that, but I do think we have existing laws on our books today that will help those business owners get where they need to be um, without putting us in harm's way of legislative things that we don't want coming our way. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Do we want to keep the public hearing open? Okay. We tried to close it last time, right? We did. We did. <laughs> Second guessed ourselves. Yes, if I can suggest to the board, um, and this is just a suggestion, so you can do whatever you want otherwise. Um, the board may want to consider keeping the public hearing open and perhaps the the council will do something to move this forward and may seek the input of the planning board. So if you keep the, the public hearing open, um, we could still be dealing with it if the board wants to um, and perhaps work with the city council. Maybe there, there'll be an ad hoc committee uh, developed from this and maybe planning board members who want to can volunteer to be on that committee, work on it, and then um, you know bring it back and conclude this public hearing at some time in the future. Um, and you know after the council's had a chance to perhaps look at it more, but we don't. We really don't know. The council ultimately has the final say, and it's going to require the signature of, of the mayor too. But um, that's just my suggestion if you want to. Mike. Uh, John, are we under some sort of time constraint? Uh, I'm sorry, is the city council under a time constraint to, to move this forward? Um, great question. Um, I, mean, I mean, that's a great idea. I mean, I, yeah. I, mean, I, I like the, where you're going with this to kind of keep it open, open for debate and massage it and, and do what we need to do to it. But um, are we in a position to do something like that? My, my understanding talking with the city solicitor is I think the planning board had 21 days to issue a recommendation to the city council but uh you know you can choose to keep it open but that just means the city council could theoretically close their hearing without your input yeah yeah we, we i mean we do have a limitation but yeah, yeah. Well, i mean is the board is, does this board want to continue working I on think this it's or? 21 days from the point we close the public oh. hearing right oh, okay so we don't Definitely. close the public hearing then okay we, i gotcha yeah it, it goes on infinitely. We, we could always republish it if necessary, if we had to. But do we want to do that? Claudia. So it, it seems after hearing all of people's viewpoints and the very um, insightful comments from um, our public that as a planning board, we're often called upon to make technical judgments as to what might be in the best interest of the city with the city council taking the lead on policy. It strikes me that this mural situation is about 
90% policy and very little technical. So given that we're not in our usual role, um, it might make sense to continue our public hearing and make sure that the council is aware that we're not doing this to shirk any sort of responsibility, but to potentially help them formulate a policy that makes sense if they think that we have something to offer to them. Because technically, um, you know, Casey has done a great job in terms of crafting an ordinance that if it is the will of the, the public and its elected officials to go in a mural direction, you know, I don't, I don't really see consistent with First Amendment concerns how it can really be regulated and locked down very much further. So, and maybe our city solicitor is a First Amendment expert and maybe he's not, but this is an area of the law that's really, really tricky and quite thorny. So that if, if it depends on that, then that's not really this board's expertise either. So if we continue the public hearing and we just maybe send a communication to the city council saying, hey, we did this in case it makes sense for us to have a, you know, more dialogue on it. You know, if you want us to close it and give you a recommendation on this partial information, we're happy to do that. You know, whatever is, whatever is most helpful. Uh, that might be, you know, a collaborative way of working this because I, what I'm hearing is that there are varying degrees of um, taste for this project, this mural project on the board, but, but generally there's a unease and unease about what the implications are. And, and that's not going to be answered. So either we go forward with the unease and make the best judgment we can and let the city council completely take care of it, or we offer, hey, you know, do you want, uh, you know, how can we help? Um, if a recommendation on incomplete information is helpful, okay. And if something else is helpful, we're, we're here. So that's a long way of saying if folks are uncomfortable really with, the, all, with all the options, you know, the, the policy judgment is not ours to make. That's the city council. Yeah. And if we, can, if we can have, you know, if we can be helpful with that, of course we want to be. Um, so given those two options, it would strike me to continue the public hearing, but, but letting the city council know, you know, we're, we're not shirking our responsibility, we're not trying to hold you up. We've got these concerns that we can't address in our process. So... That would be my suggestion. Chairman, Phil, just trying to help out with this discussion and debate. Um, I, I'm really surprised myself of the degree of opposition that I've heard in regard to this. Um, personally, and I've said this, I said this to, at the planning board the last meeting, and I, and I said it at the city council. You know, personally, I don't have a problem with murals, and I, and I think of them more of as art. And art can be a, a lot of things, and not everybody likes all the art that's out there. Um, but it's an issue that hasn't received any type of polling results. Mm. And because it affects the entire community because the entire community ends up seeing these murals as they pop up and as they will pop up so i i'm surprised personally um uh, kind of the backlash i i got for some of the comments i proposed or or said at, at public hearings on this two of them so far now this is the third so you know i'm not personally comfortable, not that I'm voting on this, but I'm not personally comfortable um, with the public um, results of what I heard from the public, you know, regarding this. There's a lot of um, animosity. You know, the art community seems to always be in support <coughs> of an issue like this, but that's a small portion of our population, whereas a more broad portion of our population, I'm really surprised at how 
much against against this issue they are you know so it it it, it, it goes a lot deeper than you know what most people think I mean people have strong opinions of this and I didn't even realize it got to that point but you know we're we're now talking about introducing this matter into Woburn you know and what was it 10 years ago you know the police department had their hands full uh, trying to get under control the onslaught of graffiti that was popping up in this in this city and in I said at the public hearing of the City Council we were lucky they were able to do that you know a lot of communities have just pretty much given up on that and you know it's, it just becomes part of the the landscape whether you like it or not you know here yeah we're gonna have murals and whether you like them or not you know and it is the public support is the majority of the public you know I think we're always worried about what the majority thinks well here we haven't had enough polling to really feel or find out what the majority of the public feels and a lot of communities do a lot of polling these days and the results of polling help policymakers adopt ordinances you know make them feel more comfortable I, I just think we haven't done that aspect of muralization potential of war so David so in response to that John we have public hearings yeah. That's how we do it in Woburn. We do have public hearings. It's publicized however they publicize it. And we've had meetings in this place, in this room, where we've had a lot of people who came for or against a, a thing, whatever it was. And people have had the opportunity, how many times has this been advertised, to come. There are people here tonight who came who um, are aware that we were having this meeting today and we're going to make a decision and I assume we're having a public hearing at the at the council meeting so there's opportunity for the people to come out and speak I'm not sure about polling <coughs> We've kind of over the last few years found out that's not always what we what we thought it was going to turn out to be but um I, I like the system we have, which is just, you know, you advertise and the people who are interested come and, and say whether they're for or against it. And that seems to be the, the democratic way in Woburn. Mr. Chair? Yes, Mike. Not only, Dave, I, I would agree with you, but I've been on this board a long time. And when we do, uh, yeah, tell me. So when. We pass something that's, you know, a building goes up, like, for instance, the courthouse. People start freaking out when it, and they start building it. And they go, well, it was a public hearing. Where were you? You know, people don't know until they see, you know. They may not catch all the public notices or whatnot. You know, it just, it's just one of those things that happen. Um, you know, polling, uh, you know, it's, it, with, the, with the technology nowadays, all electronic, you know, it, do something on the website, you know, whatever. But um, but people are more reactive than proactive. So I'm kind of what I'm getting at, I guess. So, um, I, you know, I, I do we just keep, keep this open? I mean, I, it seems like we're, we're, we're beating a dead horse here. So um. somebody could put forward a motion. Mm -hmm. That's right. Basically, to continue motion to continue. Well, that's certainly one option or a motion to send an unfavorable or a motion to send a favorable. Everything's on the table. What 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 the board what what is the will of the board? Can I, Mr. Chairman, can I just comment? I, I, I think it's one of those things and, and I do agree with uh, David. Um, you know, we, this is polling and I think it's really going to be left up to the voters on this. You people, what you got feeling and you probably got to go with your gut and that's probably your best sense that you can use you know and let the dice roll yeah what, what what makes this kind of a tricky issue is that we're trying to address a problem that we don't have <laughs> right so <laughs> um by addressing the problem that we don't have are we creating a problem like all of a sudden 
let's say we the council votes for this and now we have regulations on murals will the sign department have 50 people sending an application to put up a mural whereas in the meantime they wouldn't even think of it there is not a mural in the city of Woburn that I'm aware of it would have to comply with the sign ordinances right so and if people have tried to put murals up at this point I think the sign ordinances and the building inspector has done a good job of monitoring that and not letting it happen as we speak because I don't know of any maybe there is some in some industrial one of the industrial parks on the side of a building that I'm not aware of and honestly those are probably okay because we don't see those on a regular basis um, but that's what makes this hard you know it's like when they you know when the guy fired Kramer in, in Seinfeld and he actually didn't work there you know the guy says you're fired and he says well, I don't work he says that what makes this so hard <laughs> and that's, that's so, you know, that's sort of what this is. This is like we don't have a problem right now. Are we going to create a problem with this by regulating it? Um, when maybe you know we 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 don't need to do anything. So, Jim, I'd like to make a motion to continue the public hearing, send a correspondence to the city council that we're unable to give them a recommendation at this point and we offer any assistance if they are welcome to our help. Would you like to continue that public hearing till our next meeting? Yes, please. Okay. Does anybody know when that is? April 9th. Two weeks from today. Oh, is that right? We may not even have but, um April 9th would be the next Put it off for a month, too, so, if you wanted to. <laughs> so continue with the I'm not sure on that date. I'm, I just threw that oh, out there. Okay. <laughs> Karen, well, is it April 9th? April 9th and then April 23rd. Okay. How about April 23rd? No, April 9th. That, that would make more sense because the city council would have time to have I another. would pick the 23rd. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's what you did, right? As amended. You picked the 23rd. I did. Okay. All right. So we have a, a motion by uh, Jim to continue the public hearing until April 23rd. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Claudia. All those in favor? Not discussion. Oh, discussion. Sorry. Okay. I'm opposed. I think we should close it and vote on it and send it to the, to the council. But we'll vote right now and find out what we're going to do. Okay. All those in favor? Any more discussion? All those in favor? Discussion? Uh, just to comment on uh, Dave's position that I agree yes. with him. I think it should be closed and we should send an uh, unfavorable recommendation. Okay. So we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor of the motion. Well, it was seconded, right, for the discussion? Yeah, okay. I seconded right. it. Yeah. All those in favor of the motion. One, two, three, four. All those opposed? Three. Carries four to three. Discuss it at the uh, April 23rd meeting. It does make it interesting, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Okay. All right. Here here on. On. Okay, up next is Sherman Terrace subdivision. I'll be, I'll be for you. Update on progress toward completion. Tony Giuliano. Good evening again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the record, Attorney James Giuliano, Giuliano Law Group, 607 Main Street, Woburn, Mass. I'm trying to get this up on the screen for everyone so they can see. I do have answers as promised. I think I have a lot of answers. Um, I do have a, a seven copies of what is proposed for material for the fill with the Motion turnaround. Motion to accept uh, so moved. the copies. Second. Motion by Claudia, second by Jim. All those in favor, seven zero carry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. screen went to sleep but that's okay um, so what I was able to find out with regards to uh, if you remember Miss Cassidy's comments back about a month ago uh, was essentially you correct so the, the turnaround after site visit and speaking with the developer the turnaround is uh, it, it's shrunk and it's encroaching out of the easement area that was 
proposed in the original as-built plan uh, that was recorded at the Registry of Deeds back in, I believe, 2020. So the, what I was told was that upon construction of the dwellings, there were some issues that the foundation was incorrectly placed, and then as a result, a variance was sought and, and received by the Board of Appeals for one of the lots, and that sort of switched and changed all the grades a little bit, so on and so forth. So what I am proposing is that we will need to give this board a uh, certification by the engineer that is currently involved. The engineer did have a say in the fill. So the prior fill, I believe it was some sort of Rutgard geo cell. When we spoke to the engineer, he could not certify that. There was some certification. Obviously, it has to be uh, H20 loaded, which means basically it can carry 16,000 pounds uh, for a uh, wheel load or 32,000 pounds for an axle load. This is the current material that's there is not able to sustain that load. So again, you're probably just gonna get vehicles, but we're, we're looking to design this so that it can handle heavier trucks. So what's gonna have to happen is that material is gonna have to come out and we are proposing what was the recommendation of the engineer. So there is gonna be a certification of a, a permaturf which can handle the loads that uh, I just mentioned a couple of minutes ago. So that's what's gonna have to happen. Materials get to come out and we're gonna have to put new material in. It's sort of like a honeycomb structure. You probably have seen it. It uh, it's, goes on top of uh, loom and then gravel, sand, and then you put this honeycomb substance and then it's able to handle the loads that we're proposing. So that's gonna have to come in. Uh, Mr. Reum uh, at the engineering department also certified that uh, he believes that this is a, a material that would be able to handle the loads for any turnarounds. Um, so basically, that's where we're at. We're going to have to basically certify again. The retaining walls are going to maintain. They're going to stay there. But we are going to have to get certification again on the drainage, how it affects it. We are working on that right now. Um, and the developer is sort of working towards rectifying this. I did mention that probably the easiest way to do it, if he can, is to use that turnaround and, and put it entirely in the easement area. If that can't be done, we're going to have to redraft some easements that are uh, obviously to the board's uh, liking and work something out. But uh, if we can work a turnaround that is within the easement area, even if it is a certain percentage smaller than what was proposed, we would have to discuss that at some point. So. Um, I don't know if the board has any questions or the board has any feelings towards what's been going on. Yes, sorry, through the, through the chair. Um, Councilor, can you address the as-built plan? It looks like there was an as-built plan that was um, filed in December, but that is not correct from what needs to go onto the ground. So what is your proposal with regard to that? Yeah, so, that, so the as-built that was drafted was sort of like a, an ongoing as-built as what was there at that time. Currently, what's there right now, um, it was advantageous for us to see what was there versus what was supposed to be there. And upon recommendation, uh, Mr. Slager developed an as-built plan as of what's there now. Not to say that that's what we're suggesting that's going to be the as-built, but that's just sort of a, a progressive as-built, I guess, if you could label it as something so okay so the idea would be that when this is all rectified you would file a revised as bill without a doubt and again this is just so everyone can kind of see what's going on I mean as you can see the turnaround in that gray area is outside the easement area that was proposed uh, we have a retaining wall that's there and it's smaller than what was supposed to be so again once we sort of put everything together and, and see what is uh, amenable you know, to the engineer, and then what's amenable to the to the board, we can sort of put something together as a final as built for approval. And if it's not uh, going to be approved, or the board doesn't is not satisfied with it, we'll have to come back to the drawing board and, and figure something out. I think we're almost there. I think we've identified all the issues that are there at this point in time. We've started to rectify it. So the next step again is for the developer to take that material out, replace it with the permaturf material that will sustain those axle loads, and then figure the drainage out based on that material, see if those retaining walls have any effect on it at all. Hopefully they don't. I don't believe they will based on the engineer's recommendations and sort of comments at this point, but we'll, we'll find out once it's 
once it's put in there. So. Okay, um, Councillor, one last question. Sure. I see that your new completion date expires on the 31st of May, 2024. We had discussed this at the last meeting and you had suggested coming back in tonight would be helpful and it appears that it is helpful because you are certainly way further along uh, tonight than you were two weeks ago. So I guess the question I have for you is, what is the next step? Good question. The next step is to now get that old material out the new material in and then we can do drainage calculations based on that okay. we're going to see if we can actually create the uh, turnaround within the easement area to see how much it actually shrinks it if it's egregious then we're gonna have to figure something out with the easement as it stands right now obviously as you can see that turnaround is encroaching so, in so my question uh, i guess I, I let me ask the question in a more understandable way you have until may 31st 2004 to fix this mm -hmm. Do you think you can make it? And if not, what steps should we take now to help this process towards completion? Yeah, another good question. I would say by next meeting, next meeting is April 9th, I will have a definitive answer as to if this can be done. I, I can certainly draft the easements and all, all the necessary documentation by that point in time. The only hang up and question I would have for the developer that I still don't have an answer is, can the physical work be done? Can the, can the material be taken out? Can the new material be brought in? And then can we calculate all the drainage in that period of time? Um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can complete it by the end of May. I will have a definitive answer by your next meeting, though. Like I can assure you that. And if, if it doesn't look like it will be, then we're going to have to discuss it and, and perhaps ask for uh, so, an extension. So um, through the chair to John, I know I personally won't be here for the next meeting. So I got the sense that the agenda for the next meeting was almost non-existent. So should we be planning for an April 9th meeting? Or is this something that we can move to the 23rd along with whatever it is we would ordinarily be doing on that 9th? Yeah, not only that, I have a question. And I know I'm Johnny come lately to this issue, but I've been intrigued um, by the happenstance that you're trying to explain your way through, right? So, Attorney Giuliani, can, can you deliver a clear title right of way for this subdivision, right? A clear title right of way with a turnaround um, that's in accordance with what the planning board originally approved um, or do those issues have to be worked out? Yeah, as I mentioned, right now, as far as clear title, no, because if you look at the turnaround, the turnaround is constructed in, and my eyes are not great, so the, uh, the, the, the proper, the dwelling that sits to the right. So that's, that's an issue. Now, the, the question begs, if we put the turnaround as it exists and sort of shift it so that it's up against the retaining wall, Structurally, will that be acceptable? And will the board accept that, even though it's probably going to have to be a little bit smaller than was required? If that's the case, then yes. But now, I mean, you're legally obligated <clears throat> to deliver a, a turnaround and a right of way that you control. And is this all? Is this a private property now? I mean, excuse me, is this a private right of way or is this going to be a public right of way? Th this was approved, yeah. This was approved as a private right of way. A private right of way. Correct. Okay, so you still have to create that private right of way within an area that you totally control. You're your your developer. Correct. The person you're representing. You cannot put um, easements on other people's property for which the grantor of that easement is not granting you the easement. So how are you guys going to accomplish this in the time frame? You got to negotiate with that property owner if, if in fact you cannot remove the turnaround from where it is or where you want it to be. That, that's correct. So uh, procedurally, when the developer owned the entire parcels, um, the easement was put on. So obviously, it was granted on, on as part of the. The planning board application when uh, back in 2020, I believe, and Attorney Salvati submitted it for Mr. Sheree. But to answer your question, yes, if at this point where there are owners of both of those dwellings, 
if we have to expand the easement into one of those property rights, we need permission. Absolutely correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, so, so to, to further your question, to play it out, we may have to contain it in, in, in the original easement area that we, we gave. Okay. That may, so, that may have to happen. Okay. So for the board's consideration, right, um, you guys are going to need some time to see if you can achieve a successful conclusion of acquiring easements so that you can deliver to this board a clear title right of way private as it is who's going to be in charge of maintaining it blah 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 okay so you have a lot of work to do i don't know even know no one knows i guess at this point in time if this can be achieved and if it can't then you're going to have to alter the plans and this board's going to have to decide um, whether or not they're going to go along with the alterations and there were other alterations besides you know just this turnaround area so this stuff really has to be worked out and you have to do you have to on behalf of your client deliver to this board an ultimately approvable as built plan that's the same as a subdivision plan basically you, you can't give us a plan showing easements you, you don't have the right to grant or you, your own the developer doesn't have the right to grant you have to give us a clear title everything when can you do it or how long do you think that'll take i'm looking and thinking july 4th you know um you get you got to work out a lot of things and then you have to have the engineer certify that the modifications the physical modifications the right of way will actually work you're going to have to get the drainage calculations established through a qualified engineer certifying to this board so you got a lot of work you get work cut out for you legally but engineering wise you also have that and all that has to be that has to be delivered to this board so that we can consider a legal plan of which to put the final signature on so we can you know record this and it's all good all the deeds of the properties that are associated with this thing are all clear title properties including the right-of-way everybody following that yeah yep yeah so it's it's you're 100 percent correct it's a, can, it's a can of worms you gotta you gotta line all those worms up take them out of the can and and put it all to writing and it's all gonna be legal yep 100 percent right. correct <laughs> yep. to, to show our cards too the the, the first idea and, and i think what would be the easiest for everybody is to shift that turnaround into the existing easement area that's number one that's that's our number one goal i think we can uh, we can uh, determine that that's that can be done based on our conversations with the engineer and the builder and then that takes away all the easements so now we're not dealing with homeowners and, e and additional easements now we're just dealing with the easement that was approved from the beginning which would make every everyone's life easier so so through the chair Please. um claudia um, <laughs> maybe you have a better idea too. Um, I, I'm saying this has to be pushed out rather than month to month, meeting to meeting, you know, dealing with it. Um, it's one of those matters that should be tabled, not forgotten, but until Attorney Giuliano, that's the correct pronunciation. I'm Giuliano, talking. correct. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're good. And, and until you're ready to come back, you have everything cleared up, you're not going to waste our time. You're not going to waste your time. Yeah. You know, once you have everything cleared up, then come back. Mm. And so, put, so John, just playing off of that, um, your subdivision um, completion date is the 31st of May. So, it makes sense, I think, to um, put it on our agenda for the meeting prior to that, because either it's all done, or you're going to need an, an, an extension of time. So, Karen, what is the meeting? prior to the 31st of May. May 28th. All right. At 7 p.m. All right. So I would make a motion to continue this matter to May 28th at 7 p.m., at least for discussion. Yeah. Motion by Claudia to Mr. continue Chairman, the meeting till 28th. Do while. I have a second on the motion? Mr. Chairman, I have my hand up for a while to trying to be recognized prior to the motion. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Callahan. I'll, I'll withdraw. Jim, I'll withdraw the did motion. I didn't see you. Mr. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Apologies. Giuliano. This is a four-year project for a two-lot division. Okay. You put your turnaround in the wrong location. 
we didn't have the turf material that you presented tonight. It was mentioned last time that you were here. It was found to be acceptable by the engineer. So why, A, you had it in a retainer wall without approval from the original drawing. The turnaround is built in the wrong location, wrong size, and was gonna require an easement modification with a prior attorney that is now kind of falling through the, the way. Why can it not go in the original location at the original size? We haven't determined it, it, it can't at this point. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm getting at is, is even though there's a retaining wall, I, I don't, uh, the, the height may, if we regrade is what I'm saying, then we may be able to put that turnaround and move the retaining wall within the easement area. So we, we, so your engineer on this project, Mr. Slager, is fully aware of the, the design requirements for H20 loading, it's very common, okay? The location of it, dividing the lots and all that nonsense is going on in this development. And it's in, built in the wrong location. Because you were at the as-built timetable when this all came to a head. And over the last several months, nothing has happened to correct that prior to you coming on board as the attorney of record, okay? To modify that situation and make it right. And now you're saying that you want to see if you can look at it and put it back in its original location, which had no constraints on it prior to putting in a retaining wall, like I mentioned, that wasn't a part of the original subdivision plan, okay? And now you're trying to muddy the water, it appears, with drainage calculations. The drainage calculations are for what material? The drainage calculations for, is for the material that was approved back in 2020. Which material? That, I'd have to go back to the, well, to the, the meeting. The but the turf reinforcement material? Correct, everything, yeah. So, so basically, with the, gra the grading's a little bit different throughout both lots. So it would be the new, gr the new grades and the new material. I'm trying to understand what you're referring to. So the turf, turf reinforcement material that stabilizes it so heavy equipment can run on it mm -hmm. is the only change in materials. That's the only change in materials, correct. At your next meeting, I'm gonna request you to develop a document similar to this at least a week prior to it so we can review it, see what the subsurface requirements are that differentiates between this product that your engineer approves and the one you have presently approved by the subdivision uh, plan. I haven't heard between either attorney why this cannot go in its original location. I have not heard why it is trying to be modified to a smaller dimensional property. What the reasoning is for that. I've heard everything but, and it concerns me, because there's a previous, there's a pretty good track record of timetable that goes with the developer. It's not a positive one, okay? Um, I will tell you, currently, on May 31st, I don't expect to be giving an extension, okay? Understood. Two yeah. lots, this is a 12-month job at best. Yeah, and if I may comment on that, so I don't disagree with anything you just said, um, and, and I'm not discounting, it, as far as my practice goes, I'm not discounting putting that back in the original place where it was supposed to go from day one. So my stern conversations with said developer does not negate having that as an option. Um, because like I mentioned to you before, if the retaining wall has to come down, in order to meet those original requirements, then that is something that we may have to do and we are discussing, or I'm discussing with the builder. So, so that is not off the table, as, if, as, if I may answer your concerns, because I, 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 uh, I empathize with your concerns uh, completely. Just you know, obviously being on that side of the table and, and just doing from my experience. So uh, it, it, is, is an, it is not off the table at this point in time, and that's my discussions to sort of answer your question. One additional question. Are you currently working on the site now to make corrections? Right now there has, uh, <laughs> no, not right as of now. We're trying to figure out, I'm trying to have conversations with the developer as to now that we have the material, now stuff can happen 
as of tomorrow, now that this material is when certified. The, when was the last time that you did work there with a crew to try and uh, resolve all these open items? From my understanding, I mean, I just came on probably a month ago, um, probably prior to that, to be candid. Thank you. I have but more. All right, I'll go. Let me Thank you. Um, just a, a question. Now, you say they're, they're ready to work tomorrow, but work to what? <laughs> what plans? <clears throat> well, like I mentioned, um, you know, I have to have a conversation with the developer tomorrow and if we determine that we can put the turnaround back in its original position we can take material out replace it in the original easement area with the original material so that would not affect the drainage calculations yeah I mean I, I don't think based on this material and again I'll get a certification this material shouldn't really affect the drainage. that's all I was concerned about okay yeah. thank you I'm yeah. good David yeah so We've kind of just danced around the idea of making the turnaround smaller. Every time we've discussed turnarounds in the years I've been on the board, 20 years, th there seemed to be a very specific calculation of how big this thing has to be in order for it to work. And then we kind of said, well, you know, we can just make it smaller. I don't you know if you can just make it smaller because isn't there a requirement that it has to be a certain size in order to function? So I think we have to... I mean, unless somebody can convince me that they, they just out of the goodness of their heart made an oversized one, and um, this would be returning it to what the requirement is, I'm, I'm just a little, I just don't understand how you can just, well, just make it smaller. It, and it works. It doesn't, it, you know, I mean, I, I don't, I think we have to go back, you have to, get these people to say this has to go where it was supposed to go it has to be the size it was supposed to be and because we get this stuff people come in and they, they try to you know I, I'm not saying you're doing this but they oh we're sorry this happened boom 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 you know we put a lot of time and effort into this when when this was first approved and then all of a sudden it's I mean I don't even know how you can put up a retaining wall by accident you know that surprises me <laughs> you know I mean I know things happen in construction but everybody I mean I the, these prof people on this board are professionals and we look at these these plans all the time and they're very specific you know so somebody not paying attention yeah I, I think uh, not that I can answer all your questions but from what I've been told the variance had to be sought because the foundation was laid in the incorrect area, which sort of snowballed into this whole situation that we're in right now. So, so you're saying they they built the house in the wrong place? The original foundation that was supposed to go there did not end up going where it was supposed to. Correct. By how much? That I don't know exactly. I can get that, but yeah, that would be a good thing to know. Yeah, but but I do know talking to the developer that that sort of like I said snowballed everything into being too close to certain things and then changing the grades and so on and so forth. Not that it's an excuse, but that's sort of to answer your question. Um. It's still north of Montville Avenue. <laughs> Bob? Yes. Are you, are you good? I'm good. good. Um, does the developer still own lot one or was that deeded? Uh, the one on the left has been deeded. I believe both of them have been deeded out. Um, because I'm sitting here looking at a picture of the lot one driveway encroachment, and that's no longer the developer's property. Correct. So if the person who bought lot one likes their driveway <laughs> and says, you're not coming on my property to change anything on my property, I own this, and, you know, obviously there's a title issue, right? Because the lot in the plan and what was deeded to him is not what was on our subdivision plan so that's going to come home to roost someday but to you know th th through the chair to jim they may or may not be able to fix this and then the question becomes what do we as a board have as options so you know either you can fix it or you can't fix it and then if you can't fix it then 
the options for the board, none of them are particularly good, right? So the question is, when do we want that conversation to commence? So if, I, if I may, through the chair. Jim. Um, to to uh, Claudia, uh, just to get back to you on that, I would uh, request the applicant to bring his uh, design engineer to the next meeting to answer these questions directly. What he can do, we know where the plans are, we'll know what the de deviation is between the existing foundation, we'll know where the new retaining wall is, how much things have to shift, and we should be able to base some decision, make some decisions at that point, and be factual instead of be, you know, grabbing up the EF for answers and, and uh, getting some background to it. Unfortunately, Mr. Giuliano is uh, behind the eight ball here, taking on the, the project at the 11th hour. So uh, I think that would be wise. And I'd probably make that recommendation to the other. Um, through the chair to Jim. So when you, as the prof building professional, look at this and you think to yourself, well, it might make sense for the board to be actively involved in fixing what was not our screw up. But you can look down the pike and you can think, well, at some point we're going to be asked to approve something that isn't what we originally improved, approved. So we might as well have our hand in in the meantime. Is that kind of where you're going with that, Jim? It is, and you know, keep in mind the, the background of this retaining wall, if I'm correct, is the same one that was over the property line that we only came to light because the neighbors were contending it when the Yazbills first started getting generated. Okay, so it wasn't brought forward. And you know, you know, the openness to a mistake is a lot easier to resolve when everyone has the same amount and you can move forward. Being forced into a reactive position all the time never bodes well, in my opinion. I just think we're, we, we get boxed in, and I don't feel comfortable making decisions in that manner. And I think this board is very open to s situations that our developers and, and all the city find themselves in when mistakes occur or omittances occur as long as they're, they're dealing with you up front and honestly. Um, and, and the more time that people have to resolve it, the better. You usually come up with your best solution. But doing it in haste, it doesn't work out that well. Anyone? That's it? I just so noticed. I had a motion, but I withdrew it because I can't see as far as Jim. So Jim, I think, has a better idea. No, I, I think uh, the only thing I'd like to add is to have the applicant bring his engineer to the next meeting whenever Claudia was proposing. And that way we can get some first-hand answers and try and work through the issue. Um, and anything that can be presented ahead of time, I think the board members would be able to review it on their own and uh, come in ably prepared uh, to get to a resolve. Um, but I think talking about things and looking at a, a plan on the, the screen doesn't do it justice either. Um, that if you can analyze things ahead of time, uh, it just it make, makes it go quicker. And I think that's the beauty of the planning board uh, when you're, you're dealing with more professionals than you are when you're dealing on zoning board where it previously was. You know, it's more residential and, and homeowners. So you have collectively a lot of engineers and developers that have a lot of experience. Same thing with the members on this board. You, you get to the bottom line a whole lot quicker if everyone has all the information in the way in the decision making. So Claudia's initial um, motion was to uh, continue this to May 28th. Am I correct? That's what mm -hmm. you originally said. And so the question would you like is, to have it before yeah. before that, Jim? I, I think that, you know, right now, other than a little rain this this week, you're into full construction season. Should be. The sooner that the, the information is put back to the developer, the sooner this can get behind us. It's, um, I'd like to see it in probably late April twenty third meeting. Would be my suggestion. 
Okay. Is that a motion? Make a motion to continue, continue the, the April 23rd meeting with the applicant bringing his engineer for a question and answers. I'll second that. Second by Claudia. Yeah. All those in favor? 7 0. Carries. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Just Goodbye. as a housekeeping rule, um, is, is there a meeting on the 9th as well? Or um, I don't know if it's right determined. Now, as of right this minute, there is. Okay. But okay. in 10 to 15 minutes, it could <laughs> I'll, be different. I'll, I'll check tomorrow only because I got, I got something to it file. It could be different. I got a separate matter to file, and I just didn't know what it was. You want to sit around. Just no, sit no. around and wait. What do you tired. got to do? You got nothing to do. Come on. I'm tired. It's been a long day. Thank you, though. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you, attorney. All right. Planning board director's update. And I, John, I think you should go right to the MDTA thing. You want to go right? Yeah. 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 Well, Let's you see. don't have too much data. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Sounds good. Do you want me to go right yeah, to did, it right now? Give the update and then go oh, okay. right to the. Uh, um, and I think we have. Um, one of the aldermen in the audience this evening um, that may want to offer comments on, and I, and I did offer uh, Alderman Marissa Brew, and I, I gave her a copy of what I gave to the board this evening, um, this afternoon, uh, in an email. And um, I just want to caution everybody in me giving this presentation this evening. Um, this is the most preliminary of nature relative to the city of Woburn dealing with the MBTA slash 3A non-age restricted multifamily housing statute. Um, I gave you a synopsis of what's involved with this. I don't know how much of this information you already have under your belt, if at all, but um, I gave you the information that I've been working on thus far, and, and again, this is a brief summary of what this particular statute has in store by mandate of the state upon the city of Woburn. Um, I can read through this, I can present it, or I can answer questions of the board, and I assume everyone in preparation for this meeting tonight read through what I had written and um, you know I, I just want to know uh, you know if the board wants me to go through point by point or, or read it verbatim um, or just answer questions Dave John is this the issue that Milton is having with the um, absolutely okay and 171 other communities of which some have passed bylaw zoning ordinance is ordinances and overlay districts for their particular community relative to complying with the statute um, the vast majority of the 171 communities that are considered MBTA communities and there are four different categories of MBTA communities there's rapid transit there's commuter rail which Woburn is and there's a budding uh, MBTA communities and then there are smaller abutting MBTA communities those are communities those two latter groups don't have um, train stations or bus stations you know they're just abutters to communities such as Woburn and I just came from one as the planner in Georgetown um, and spearheaded their effort and they haven't gone to town meeting yet town meeting in Georgetown is the first Tuesday in May and the annual town meetings for the vast majority of towns within the MBTA designated communities doesn't really start in earnest until late April through May you know but there's a stretched out period of time some have already gone to town meeting and taken care of this others haven't yet and, but the vast bulk of the MBTA communities haven't dealt with this yet. And um, as I pointed out in this little synopsis, is that for Woburn, the statute dictates calculation-wise that we are to provide for at least one overlay district 
that can handle the development potential of upwards of 2,631 apartments and their multifamily apartments, meaning these are three bedroom plus units. That's multi-age, I mean, uh, multifamily, non-age restricted housing units. And so it's for four more people. So this is the statute that came out of the last days of the Baker administration in the midst of COVID. Um, it came out of the state house. Uh, I've made public comments over the last year or so in regard to this um, that I'll keep at bay this, this evening. But um, there's still a lot to learn. But what I'm, what I'm actually working on is a full report to give to the planning board, to give to the city council, and to give to the mayor. And I've been working very closely with the mayor since the first day I got here, which was less than two weeks ago now. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. So I've really spent a lot of time with this, but I spent a lot more time already, you know, many hours in my previous position in Georgetown. Now, some of the funny asides with this so far, um, Merrimack Valley Planning Commission um, worked with us diligently, and they only have 17 communities. It's either 13 or 17 communities. And they helped us draft the ordinance specific to Georgetown, and they helped us with the overlay district. We already had multiple public hearings on it, and we're a Zoom town still. So we worked through this already. We had a big problem in Georgetown. A lot of communities produce 10% of their total housing stock relative to the statute. In Georgetown, somehow or other, they came up with this calculation, 24% of our existing housing stock of 2,100 units, 24% had to allow for 750 units in that town, which is a huge composition change to a, to a community. And for a community that provides its own water and doesn't have any drops of water to spare, nor does it have any resources of water to draw from, and it, you know, so the first 90 degree day, you can't even water your garden. That's how stringent the water resource is in that town. And all those towns are like that in the North Shore. So how do we absorb that type of housing? There's no planning involved with this. You know, planning is all about planning for all the resources you need to accommodate the growth. Water, sewer, power, schools, police, fire, everything. You know, so you, you have a well-organized governmental structure. You know, in, in Woburn, look at what, in, in, in Mayor Concanon and I have already met with MAPC staff with this, their director, um, we had a very lively discussion, to put it mildly. Um, communities are not being communicated with. Uh, they're not being negotiated with. If you ask the governor or the AG, or any of these state agencies that are supposed to be helping communities deal with this and you know think about planning of what the impacts are you're not getting you're getting no no sound at all you're not getting any feedback and forget about negotiating you're not getting any negotiation we're all facing complying or else and you know what the else is it's gone from three obscure grants that are associated with the language of 3A statutory amendment language. There were three grants. All of a sudden, the three grants have spread to all state aid, and communities are getting threatened that they will not receive any state aid, they won't qualify for any grants or any of that if they do not comply with the requirements of this statute. That's a heavy burden because most communities couldn't survive financially without, you know, the state aid that we receive. What is is there a time frame on this? Like, yeah. when do they expect? Yeah, yeah the, no, the time frame for Woburn, and you know, and it's for Woburn because we're a city and we can pass ordinances, you know, in pretty quick order when we have to. But the deadline for total compliance, and and there's no waiver to this at built into the process right now is December 31st of this year. So 
you know, I, I'm, I'm working with the state. I've already put um, the zoning overlay district um, into the state based on the data that MAPC has provided for every community. You know, some more particulars. 75% of the 2,631 units, 1,900 plus units, 75% of those have to be located within a half mile radius of Anderson Station. It also stretches down to Mishawam and there's debate whether there's any type of passenger pickup or drop off at Mishawam Station. Does anybody know for a fact? I haven't put up the What's that? It's a flag. Yeah, stop. a whistle oh, stop. Yeah, and, yeah, and it never stops. Yeah. You have to flag it. So I was questioned about this today by someone that, oh, that's not a station. Well, it is a station, and it's recognized as a station by MAPC and the state agencies. So what you have is Anderson and Michigan, and you could have conceivably um, a half mile radius connected between the two even though there's more distance than a half mile between the two but you could have one elongated overlay district that you could conceivably put all hundred percent of the 2631 units or a minimum of 75 percent 1900 have to be located by state statute within that one uh, overlay district the other 25%, 600 plus units, they could be scattered all over town wherever we wanted to as, or agreed to as a community. Again, trying to be in compliance with the statute as it's written now, as it's being mandated now upon the city of Woburn. And, you know, we don't know at, that, at this point where those other satellite overlay districts would be, but they all have to be a minimum of five acres each. You know, so we may have, go ahead, Dave, excuse me. So, so if you do an overlay, that doesn't mean the people that own the land have to sell it and build. Right. It, I it, mean, it, like if we said, okay, we're going to make the Marshalls Warehouse our, our area because they're not going anywhere. Right. There's right? no, that's an important, this is the most important, and I put it in this synopsis. The most important thing to take into consideration is that the overlay district, a minimum of 50 acres in METS overlay districts comprising a minimum of 50 acres for the city of Woburn handling the 2,600 units. Um, they can, those 50 acres can be comprised entirely of developed land. If you have undeveloped land within the 50 acres, that could be developed, that, that's good. But you can have developed land too, and I did, did point that out. The, the only thing you can't do is put undevelopable land, wetlands, steeply sloped lands. They'll take that those those lands out of the equation, and you still have to come up with that 50 acres. This overlay district or districts has to pass muster with the state too. It's just not up to us. It has to pass muster with the state. So everybody's zoning ordinance amendments that provide for this statutory language um, that has to pass muster with the state along, again, with the overlay district. We, we have until December 31st at this point in time. Now, there's a question, and it's a valid question. Look at all the multifamily housing that this city has permitted recently. You know, but you know, more importantly, over the years, we have more multifamily housing than any of our abutting communities, and abutting communities to abutting communities, perhaps with the only exception, maybe Burlington. You know, they have a lot of multifamily, and it doesn't seem like they're stopping with that in any near future. So we're trying to get credit. We're trying to, we are trying to negotiate, get at the table, and have them take into consideration. And we did hear today in one meeting we were at, um, I say we, the mayor, uh, Casey and other um, city officials um, that there's a community out there that's it, supposedly I think it, it, it's rumor but they've negotiated successfully with the state so that some of their multifamily development projects that were recently built do comply with the statute so they're going to be 
credit it with the number of units they have for recent multifamily. And if that's the case for Woburn, that will lessen the burden. But the point that I want to go back to real quick, um, so with the 50 acres comprised of developed land, and I, and I say this in the report, conceivably it could take up to 100 years to develop out in accordance with the statute 2,600 units in Woburn. And I use, for example, all those new multifamily developments that are along Car uh, Commerce Way right now and being developed um, on the east side um, of uh, Anderson Station and the ones that are planned for already, you know, that haven't been permitted yet, but they've been planned for. Um, there's, there may end up being more multifamily than what was permitted at Vail. I mean, I'm just suggesting that. This is not any buddy's idea yet but you know that might be comprised of more multifamily that would that would comply with this um, statute in that location so and and that really depends on this the economy that and what's going on right now there's no demand for bio space being built there's no demand for office space right now being built um, a lot of that stuff is you know and I don't know if you've noticed it but there aren't as many um, um, uh, cranes in the in the sky when you drive into Boston, you know, or, or Somerville, and there's not as much business building activity in Woburn going on right now either, and nobody knows the depth of this particular building recession that seems to be growing. You know, hopefully it doesn't get to the point where 89, you know, we replicate 89 to 93. There was a period of time in Woburn there, there was no building that took place, and you know, there's a threat of that actually happening, you know, because nobody knows where we're, we, where we are at with this economy. You know, nobody knows. I'm Mr. Chair. One second, Mike. I'm gonna, Darlene, you, you've been waiting this oh, whole yeah, time to come up. No, I, come up. Okay. There's just so much with this, it's, it's really a mess. Thank you. John, welcome. <laughs> yeah. Jumped right into it. Yeah. Um, I wish I could say this is the first I've heard of this MBTA community's uh, mandate. It's certainly not. It's been out there for over a year. In fact, I sat into or sat at, at many presentations, or at least two, to the city council about this, um, and a presentation to the business community, which I can tell you went over like a lead balloon because all the businesses who reside in the area where you are describing, down on Commerce Way, uh, we're not happy about this because when, when you start putting more residents next to right on top of businesses, that creates problems, right? But at the end of the day, welcome. <laughs> this is uh, on your shoulders now. Um, and the reason why I wanted to come down tonight is because I have been beating this drum for well over a year. We have a lot of problems to address, but this is the number one thing we need to figure out. And we cannot wait. I, I, I urge you, Director Cashel and members of the Planning Board, please do not wait until November 1st to send something to the council to approve. Because I can tell you, I will work vigilantly, vigilantly to make sure it doesn't get approved, even if I'm the only one who doesn't approve it. We need time to review what this ordinance is going to look like. We need to do this collaboratively. Yeah. Ward five and Ward six will be impacted the most by what happens here. Citywide, all of our schools were imp impacted, our police, our fire, everything. So for me, as we sit here, this is our number one thing to address. So I'm so very grateful, John, that you have jumped in with both feet. Um, I, I guess my next question would be, at what point do we start collaborating on this? I, I hear that you've had a couple of meetings. I think that's great. Um, but at what point do we start actually working on this together? Um, 
I want to answer this directly because it is the most important. I thank you for yeah, that. Because yeah. Mayor Concanon has made it absolutely clear to me from day one that this whole effort has to be as transparent with everybody, you know, councilors, planning board, the public at large, um, because it's, it, it's a huge impact on the, on the city because these aren't one or two bedroom apartments. These are all three and four. Right, I'm very much aware of that. And I, and I thank you for your thought out memo, but it, it wasn't new information for me. Yep. And, and probably wasn't new information for a lot of people here. Um, it's just now that this deadline is looming, um, I guess I, I felt compelled um, to be someplace where I know that I would be heard. Um, this board is always so thoughtful about everything that you do. Um, I know you don't, I don't come down here um, just to, to spend the night with you all. I come down when I know I'm worried. So that's why I'm here. And I'm, I'm looking for a punch list of what's next. When I heard you say you started drafting some things, Director, I, I get a little nervous because I'm thinking, oh gosh, well, the city council hasn't seen anything. Nobody's seen anything yet. Yeah. And, and it, I guess I'm a little triggered because there have been times where things in the past have come to us at the last minute and we're told you must act because there's a deadline. So I'm, I'm pleading with you all, please don't let that happen. Reach out to us. We want to work on this together. In, in, in a careful read of what I did write, it, I think I emphasized. I think you've done everything right, John. You just jumped into this. Thank you so much for even <laughs> saying yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, I do, you know, I do really want to emphasize, and I did bring it out in this writing, that this is all preliminary. It's all draft stuff. What, what I'm, when I, and I told the mayor this, hey, we really have to have a report. I have to put it together and then present it with all these scenarios. That's just, it's all preliminary work that needs to be done so that I can give it to you, the planning board, and we can, I, I would say we're gonna ha definitely have to have an ad hoc committee um, and work through this, probably starting in May, maybe even uh, during this May. month, April. But see, the, the that's a is, million years away. Yeah, but now listen, now listen this, is, <laughs> this is an important part of it, and, and I told the mayor this too. We really don't know as an MBTA region. We, we don't know what all these communities are going to do. I think there are a lot of Miltons out there, but we're not going to know what the outcome is for all these communities until they put these bylaws for adoption in front of their town meetings. Now, when you have 100, 200, 300, 400 people showing up at these town meetings and they're up in arms about this, you know, there's going to be a lot more Miltons. And what happens at the end of May when all these town meetings have taken place in, say, 50, 60, 70 of the communities conceivably shoot this down, don't want anything to do with it? Is the AG, under the orders of the governor, um, going to sue all of those communities and, and just hold up all state aid? That's a calamity. For a governor, that is a calamity. How, how do you handle something like that? That's a mutiny. <laughs> That's a mutiny of a lot of communities, right. of a lot of people. And with all due respect, counts. Director Cashel, I've always viewed Woburn as the leader and not the people that sit back to wait and see what everyone else does. We led the way on housing yeah. far long before anyone said, you must do it. We did it. And we did it better than any other community around us. And we did it happily. We did it in collaboration with the state. So the idea that we might maybe get some credit for what we did, that's ridiculous to me. So again, these are things that are gnawing at me every day. Um, and I, and I, think, 
I, I think, I, I know that you're doing what you've been asked to do, but I'm asking if you could do it just a little faster. <laughs> and I know you've just been, you just got here, um, but I don't want to wait and see what other communities are doing. We should be leading the way. Yeah, but the, prob the problem is, you know, this is, you know, I was probably more emotional when I was younger, but, you know, <laughs> that stuff is worn off. The, the thing is... Well, we're, I, we're I'm sorry. I'm emotional about these things. You know why? Because it's going to impact yeah. all the people that live in this city. No, I know. And you made a very good point, Director Cashel. You said things are slowing down. They absolutely are. But you know what's not slowing down? Is our need for tax revenue. Our need to put more money into our schools. Our need to put more money into our police and our fire. Those things aren't slowing down. So we're going to add to the burden and just say to the state, yep, we're going to do whatever you say. Uh, again, I'm just asking for a little fighting spirit here. Um, and and not, let's not wait to see what the other cities and towns are doing. Let's decide. We're either going to put a stake in the ground and say, listen, state of Massachusetts, we did this. We want credit for it. And if that little town, whoever, I'm not, I, I feel bad, I don't know who that town is, but if they got credit for it, we should. And to me, that's where we put our focus. Start there, then work our number down. That's just one little city councilor's emotional idea yeah. to this. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of deception involved with this too, a lot. And one of the things I've, told people to watch is um, Keller's interview with the governor this past Sunday morning. Um, you know, and everybody can stream it. But um, he put her on the spot pretty good. And, um, you know, there are a lot of answers that I didn't agree with. And, and Because I deal with this every day. And I've said a lot of things on TV in defense of communities um, that are having this statute imposed upon them. See, we're, we're a country of laws and laws that originate, that percolate from the bottom up. This country over the last 20 years has devised a lot of its laws from the top down. And that's not the way it's supposed to work. And especially not in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts where we have home rule. We have 351 communities that have always traditionally, since we began this commonwealth, we run our ships, our own towns, we plan for them, we, we implement infrastructure. We, we reach out to the state when we need state aid. You know, we reach out to the federal government when right. we need federal So land. you must be as outraged as I am then. Well, more so. So to know that gov the, 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 the group of folks that put this together, put these numbers together, the DHCD, they were not elected officials. Right. They were appointed board members. So I, again, to me, this is more, I don't want to use the term ammunition, but more things on our side that we should be not so willing to just say, okay, how many do you want us to build? It, it, and it really boils down to, you know, why can't Woburn grow the way it wants to, okay? Why are we being dictated, you know, for all of this multifamily development on top of the multifamily development that we already have? And there's a big plan to all of this. It, it, it's a big plan that they, they don't talk about, but, you know, they know what they're doing and they're imposing their will, you know, the way they want the world to become upon every community, you know, within the MBTA. And we're, MBTA region is just the first of the whole state that will be part of this as they go forward. Right. But again, all the more reason I'm why talking, we should... I'm talking vaguely, uh, but... Yep. No, I... I, I think you know, I think most people know what they're up to. Um, I, all I know is... If Woburn was not the city that we are, then 
I wouldn't be able to stand up here and passionately plead that we take more of an assertive stance with this. We have done the right thing before someone said, do the right thing. So, um, and, and sure, we probably need more, but we should not be dictated by the state. So again, I think we're in it from this one city councilor, and that's all I am. I'm a city councilor. I'm not anything else. Go I'm not me. governor of anything or mayor of anything, and I never will be. But what I do know is that we have done our part, and I think we have a good case to make. We just need someone to make it. That's all. You, you yes, Mr. Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to to, to, to Councillor Mercer Bruin, um, if I remember correctly, this board, under the previous administration, had generated a letter requesting that all the work that we had done towards 40B and along the Mishawam Road corridor, uh, we drafted a letter, I believe, to the, the governor um, asking for relief from this. Does anybody else remember that? That wasn't that long ago. So we, we, we did try to be proactive with this. And we well, I'm not sure I ever saw a copy of that letter. Um, maybe it did go out, and maybe we got no response, but we should have demanded a response. Uh, so uh, It was done through this board, through the, um, the then director, and I believe it was sent through the, the previous administration, the Mayor Galvin, I'm not sure. I, so we've been denied that? Karen, do you know? I, I do remember Mayor Galvin sent a letter, and I believe the City Council and the Planning Board um, co-signed it. Yeah. So, so was it flat out? I guess that's my question. So was it again, flat out me, denied? Just, I just want to question that. John brought up a great point was that at that point, we were under the sun. We were going to say, "Okay, fine. We won't. We won't take. We'll take our lumps. We won't go along with this. We'll take our lumps. We won't get the couple of grants that was at the time." Now, John, you're saying this thing is ballooning out into oh, yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. All no. right. So it, it, they're not. It certainly uh, is. Yeah. They, no, they're not playing fair, and don't expect them to. They will not negotiate with anyone. It's you follow what has been mandated or else. Right, but that's the, that's Director Cashel, did you or did you not just say that there was a town that did get credit? And, and we don't know that factually, but it was rather hinted. But this, we, in Georgetown, we went to meet with the- I'm confused, we, we okay. We went to meet with the director. I thought you said a town with the W well, got credit. Well, let's just stay with the facts, but well, we, the we, fact is, I heard you say that. So I, I'm just, I, I would like to get down to the, to if yeah. if it didn't happen, it didn't happen. Well, I mean, is, is we'll get to the bottom. On board with this, I mean, we have a rep that lives in the city. He obviously either voted for or against this legislation when it came, because it, it, they didn't just do this by executive edict, right? It was, I know that our state re representatives are not, they're, they're equally as upset um, as all of us um, because the DHCD wrote most of the rules around this law. They're not, they're, they're, I'm just saying then that person should be part of whatever this group is that puts together what the city's position is. Oh, I would hope so. I would hope so. I've taken up enough of your time. I think I've made my point. I'm so grateful, John, that you're here. Um, I, I hope I hope that the city will be a little bit um, more assertive as we approach this. And I truly hope um, that the committee that I know the mayor has spoken to me about and to you about will be formed soon um, because December is not that far away. And, and think about it, June, July, August, nobody's around. The community needs to be involved in this. Um, so again, thank you for listening Colleen, to me. Can I, just, can I just say something? Sure. Um, there, there is a great degree of assertiveness. Um, I, I really do admire um, Mayor Concannon um, in his intestinal fortitude on this. 
Um, He's the one who said that we'd be forming a committee, and I'm so grateful to the mayor for that. You know, Absolutely. Uh, because in this state, if you're not of the right party, Oh if gosh, you, I don't want to get into all that, you, John. No, this is listen, this listen. is this is about Woburn. Now, no, I know, but in it, I'm just saying. You know, they're they're bringing up subject matter here of why our state rep voted for this. Okay, you, when you're in the state house, our state rep didn't vote for what this law looks like. So at the end of the day, that was decided by a group of people that were not elected officials at the DHCD. So now we have this in our hands, and we have to decide how to proceed. Are we going to just do what we're told to do, or are we going to draft some ordinances that we think are appropriate for Woburn? And I think I heard you say that we're going to try to do that, I hope. You know, we, we, you know that, that. I mean, it's just a thing that you, you have to deal with this as intelligently as possible, as diligently as possible, as protective as possible. But you don't want to end up in jail either, because people in this country. <laughs> well, I don't think we're going to end up in jail, but we country, certainly might end up in court. People in this country <laughs> end up in jail, and they have not, They have done nothing wrong. That's what's happening in this country. Well, that's your All job. Right. You're the director, so you get to right. go to jail. So, yeah. <laughs> well, is, with that, I, 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 I got to come up with a half of right. I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about being put in jail, and I so appreciate being able to speak very freely here um, because that's not always the opportunity that other people have. So I, I do appreciate it. And thank you, John, Director Cashel, for your hard work. And I'm ready and willing to do some of that hard work. And I know Councilor DeMambro is as well. Um, I'm up for the challenge. So thank you. And I, and I love it. So thank you all for listening to thank me. Thank you, Donnie. All right. Have a good evening. Thank Thanks. You. So, nice lively discussion. Yes, Jim. <laughs> I want a couple of quick questions for the director. A little more input. Uh, 50 acre minimum, half mile from a uh, train station. They're located from the access of the train station. The dead center, the geographic well, center. One entrance to the train station. And I'm asking a question yeah. particularly. And I, I, I say that with the conversation that's taking place earlier. We have one active train station. It's only active from Commerce Way. There's no means to get there from New Boston where you're talking about all this development, okay? Well over a half mile, mm. okay? That's the MBTA currently owes us a bridge over the tracks uh -huh, and we're yeah. playing with the first station. But that's what that they're building right now. Definitely one of those bargaining tools. Just yeah, but like that's we, what they're building now. The, the, the no, 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 no. That's a private development. That's sort of going over the tracks into Wilmington, and it does not lead to the train station. We left the spur off for it. Trust me, I'm well versed in this area. Extremely well versed. Probably. Yeah, but they, they, then, then that roadway, that roadway connection leads up to um, the. The connection that goes back into the train station. Yeah, but it's not connected because we didn't give it to them. Yeah, but the plans call for a connection no, directly no, into. Actually, they don't. Uh, but the my point is here. that my point is, all right, if they don't have access and they got to go all the way around, who pays for the infrastructure for all this improvement that the state is trying to mandate beyond just the housing component of it? So in other words, you, you go and you put up those six, eight-story housing unit, okay, similar to the uh, Mall area, and you get X amount of units in there. But you have to put sidewalks in there, you have to put water and sewer, and you have to create some kind, kind of access to the train station. That off-site work be the multi-million dollar range, mm. and it's not being addressed. Well, it is being addressed. Well, I'm sure you guys are going to bring it up. Yeah. No, it is be, it's a $10 million project, and it is being addressed. Um, when it gets built, uh, it's not on a tip yet, and it's probably at least minimum five years out from implementation. But, you know, it, it, this, this administration is active in that planning right now. Um, also, very much active is the slip ramp coming off the bridge that'll go right into the T station area um, with pedestrian access. And, you know, they're, they're working on all of this. Everything takes time. I mean, 
we're, we're fighting right now to stay on the tip with the Main Street project. Um, you know, and it's the mayor's giving a valiant effort to keep that on the tip because if we um, get kicked off the tip, it'll be an arduous, very arduous task to get back on the tip some time in the future. But um, we right now have a good chance of staying on the tip with that project, and that's the number one infrastructure improvement project for Woburn. Is you know, there any other uh, development constraints they put on them? Besides the half mile and the, and the uh, number of units? No, it's just that 75% minimum number of units, 2,631, have to be located within a half mile radius. But again, with all the development within a half mile radius that already exists, new development, all the retail, um, that can all stay within the the district it doesn't have to be undeveloped land so this stretches out for many years into the future that you would have 2600 units you'd probably end up with seven eight hundred units within the 50 acre half mile radius over the next 10 15 20 years John so it would take years units. and years and years for all the existing development to be redeveloped John, 2,600 units, we're talking 10,000 people. Yeah. yeah. It's a city with, it's kind of a, it's a small city within the city of Woolbury. I mean, it would thing. make Kimball Court look like a, boy, were we lucky to get that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing, the other thing too is that it's not like, uh, just based on everything I've read, Burlington has to do this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Reading has to do oh, this. Oh, yeah. Winchester has to do mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Um, all the time, not only do you not just have to have the MBTA or the bus or, some, or the trains run through, if you border these towns, you're involved. Like Franklin is one of these ones that has said, no, they're not going to do it. And uh, Franklin doesn't even have the train. I'd like to see how Newton deals with it. Well, I, you know what? That, I, it, no, I'm just saying. No, but I'm saying we don't, we don't know how anybody's dealing with no. it. Yeah, the only two I know of is Milton and Franklin. Those are the only two. Yeah. That have already had meetings and said we're not doing. It. Yeah, there, there, there's a list. There's an active list. Yeah. If you go on executive office of um, communities and living, what is it, uh, housing and livable communities. It used to be THCD. Anyway, they have an active list that's checking off what cities and towns have actually enacted yeah. the statute amendment Kill language the for their bylaws, and um, there's probably. 20 or 30 now of the 171. Um, and, and we're not going to know what the vast bulk of these communities are going to do with this until they have their annual town meetings. You know, there's only a handful of cities in that whole region, uh, but there's a whole bunch of towns. And there's a whole bunch of towns out there that don't like this. Now, from a city standpoint, hmm. where would that come from? The mayor? No, like, right. we're not going to do it. No, no, no. Um, we Was have to. The council? The, the, no, the planning board has to hold a public hearing once the amendment language is agreed to by a committee, right? So they come forward, and planning board has to hold a public hearing. We have to show the overlay district or districts. We have to show that as part of our public hearing, and then we recommend to the council. The council has to have their public hearing, pass muster or not, and you know if it passes with them what's ultimately agreed to, then it goes to the mayor for signature. But, okay. But, so, so the council could say no. That's right. What, oh, yeah. What yeah. Eventually say yeah. Yes. I'll, 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 and a lot of this does rest with the council. We, we can recommend. That's all we do, recommend right. to the council. It's going to be up to the nine councilors. So we need, we, need to, we need to set this up that we meet on this. Yeah. <laughs> like just on this, not necessarily on you know, five other things, three A A and R's and all this stuff, yeah. and then talk about this, but that we meet just on this. Like the Zork used to do. Well, like Zork used to do with members of the planning board and the council. But unfortunately, Zork doesn't exist anymore. Though. But through the chair? Then we know of, yes, Claudia. The reason Zork doesn't exist anymore is because it can't be a subcommittee of the planning board. That if the city council in its wisdom said, you know what, we want to set up a, you know, collaboration, 
that has to be a committee of the council and then the council can invite whoever they want. But I think the problem with Zork is that it was a subcommittee of the planning board and we invited the council and that was challenged that we as the planning board don't have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. However, the council has the ability to set up what you want and to invite who you think is helpful. A memo will be forthcoming that I will sponsor. <laughs> um, and hopefully I'll get the votes to do that. I, I assume my fellow council members are as much concerned about this as you all are. We, so thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We can start that committee ASAP. So the, the, and that's what we ought to do, really, at this point in time. Well, well the council ought to do that. Right. We, we, we have tried that, right. and that didn't go yeah. well. So that's... Yeah, we, can't, we can't even do it. We but can't Darlene, do it. We're, but Darlene we're, could. We're Those ready people are going at the to next do meeting. it. Yeah. yeah. And there's no holding back. We should, we should uh, you know, commence this effort immediately. And Right, and, and uh, I know that there was discussions about doing it, you know, the, the planning uh, department forming a committee, maybe not quite as formal as what we're talking about, but I will do whatever this board needs to get us going, and if that is to send the letter and do it that way, I'll do it. Director Cashel, if you want me to stay out of the way and you do it your way and no, let no. us know who from the council is going to be on the committee, I'm happy to do it that way too. But I just want to get it moving. That's so, so Darlene, it might. Uh, so, considering how Zork crashed and burned last time, <laughs> if if it's a committee of the council, right? If the council votes and says, you know what, we need a collaborative committee, and here's who we want on it, and sends out the invites, I think that's unchallengeable. Okay, but again, I I I will do whatever Director Cashel and Mayor Con Cannon and this board feels the quickest way for us to get these meetings started. If that's the way, I'll do it. Uh, Cash Director Cashel, if you think there's a better way, again, I, I want to defer to you. You are the chairman. So I think this is the first time I'm not chairman, this director, issue so. has been discussed, right? Yeah, I think, it, I think it is. Yeah. And, and you now we know what's going on to yeah. a certain extent enough so that we can move forward. And I, and I think what we really want to do, and this is what I'm getting from everybody tonight and you two, is let's, let's start this thing, you know, tomorrow, you know. Um, so let's get going on it. I, I know enough about it, believe me, that we can start this whole process and work through it. And, you know, part of the process will be to have um, the mayor, myself, Maybe some other designated city person. solicitor should be involved. Yeah, the the state rep who did or didn't vote for it. I don't know what the story is, but I think he did. Again, I, I think that's a, a moot point. I think you know this is our house, right? This is Woburn. This is our house. If we need help from our state delegation, we'll make sure they're there to help us support whatever track that we take. I certainly know Mayor Con Cannon would do that. Um, as will the city council, but uh, again, I don't want to go on and on. I just want to start. So, um, there's, there's quite a few millions of people in this region, MBTA community people, that are really all up in arms about this. And the more they find out about it, the more upset they get. Um, this isn't a bed of roses for um, these perpetrators that are pushing this stuff on community. Right, but I guess, I guess that was a point I was trying to make earlier. We are one of the communities that has the biggest voice because we've been there, done that. So I want them to hear our voice. And thank you for hearing mine tonight. I can't tell you how much that means to me. Thank you. So, Council Boone, the way this has got to start is that the council has to decide that they want to set up a committee to talk to discuss this. They have to decide that they want the members of the planning board on that committee with them. And okay. then that has to go to either John or to us or whatever so that we can get together and do it. We cannot start the committee ourselves. Right. But it's my understanding that um, at one point there was conversations about the planning board having a committee and in potentially inviting two counselors to participate in that. What we're saying is we can't do that. Yeah, that was Zork. That, and yeah, it was, was pretty much zero. it was challenged as being beyond our authority right and so therefore we had to 
we had to disband it. So mm. the point I was trying to make is that the city council has the authority to put it together and invite us, but, but not vice versa. Okay. Um, and I only bring that up because I know um, Planning Board Director uh, Cassidy um, was at one point going to put that group together. Perhaps that's what slowed it down, although she's very knowledgeable, just as yeah, Director I, I, Cashel is. I, I, don't, I don't know about that, but I do know why Zork met its demise, and it was organizationally inappropriate for us to invite okay. city councilors. However, it is entirely appropriate for the city council to set it up and okay. invite us. All right. And let me just say, when it worked, it worked. worked. Right. Yeah, it was good. It, it really worked well. And again, on this matter, something absolutely like that needs to happen, and I believe Director Cashel was um, going to do that, but if you're saying you can't, you don't have the authority to do it, then again, cons consider it on its way. Yeah, yeah I'm just doing Excellent. preliminary work so mm -hmm. that we can get going with it. Zork was a very successful committee for a long time. For a long time, yes. until it was challenged as beyond our authority, successfully challenged. Enjoyed Zork. Yeah. Yeah, so it, 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 it did work, and, again, and if there is an appetite on the council, then There certainly will be an appetite for this particular matter. <laughs> How about we leave it at that? All right. All right, Great. thank you. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right, good discussion on that. I think I'll end that discussion on that particular subject here, and uh, there is a little more to the planning board director's update. If you want to, and I'll just read it or... Yeah, you can read no, it. Okay. Please, right. I'll comment so, if need be. So, <laughs> the next meeting of the board is scheduled for April 9th. At this moment, the only possible agenda item is reviewing final documents and signing a MILA related to 43 Pool Street, definitive subdivision that was approved on December 12, 2023. So, uh, I think the suggestion there is that maybe we cancel the April 9th meeting. Dave. So moved. Second. Motion by Dave to cancel the April 9th meeting. Second by Claudia. All those in favor? 7 0 carries. Okay. Yes, Jim. Um, what's the present policy? If, I, I think um, Attorney Giuliano um, inferred that he may be submitting an AR plan. He didn't state what he was doing. but So if an AR plan is submitted, um, there's 21 days in which to endorse such. But if we're not having a meeting within that time frame, um, we have in the in the past we have elected under circumstances people to sign it, but I would think this time of year it'd be very easy for you to notify us that there is a uh, an hour up here that needs to be signed. Could you please stop by the office and sign it? Does it um, well, need? actually, we did have um, a standing vote in place to have the chair and the vice chair be able to authorize and sign ANRs, but that um, met its demise at the end of COVID. I think we decided to not do that anymore. John, I think the fail safe is a special meeting. So if something was to happen that we had 21 days, then we would you know, figure out when we could do, for example, a Zoom meeting and just you know, get it together, do the vote, and onwards we go. Or the board can decide to reauthorize the chair and the vice chair to um, sign A and R plans. Yeah, and I would suggest you know with these lot line relocation plans that really aren't A and R plans. A and R plans is the creation, you know, of a new lot from the subdivision of another lot. But these lot line relocations. Yeah, those are, those are minor. You're not creating new lots for building purposes or anything, so it's not going to come to a surprise that a new house is being built beside somebody that didn't think there was a lot there. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so they're, but, they're but, not a big deal. The, right, but the really lot. the question for the board is if something like that happened, would we rather all spring for a special meeting, you know, to deal with it, or do you want to authorize the chair and the vice chair to, to you know, sign them again? It's, it's at the will of the board at this point. And then I have one little fun fact. It, and you guys might know this already, but I found this out over the last couple of years. Um, state statute-wise, an A&R plan, you have 21 days to endorse the plan or deny it. But there's no provision within the statute nor case law that allows for an extension of time beyond the 21 days, even if both parties agree to it. So you, you do have to act. Now, the one caveat is, is that if that A&R plan application and plan are not filed with the city clerk, 
then it's not officially filed. And um, you know, it, it, this this city has never practiced the filing, the proper filing of an A&R plan with first the city clerk to get the ball rolling time-wise. They just file it upstairs. But it, this is a real fun fact that you, you don't really want to fall on your face on. Um, constructive endorsements of plans that shouldn't receive such can be a very embarrassing situation. Anyway, that's one fun fact. Well, let me let me just jump in then um, on the issue of having more than 21 days between now and April 23rd. I would be personally comfortable if someone came in with an A and R plan and um, we needed to jump on a special meeting to deal with it, to deal with it that way, as opposed to, you know, doing anything other fancy. But that's that's just me. Yeah, and that can be done. That can be done. All right, I also, see a nod. I'm good with that. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's nodding, so that's because what we're, we're going to do. Coming in and out, in and out, on, or zoom it. Right, right. We could also persuade staff. Um, why don't you wait a few days until we're having a meeting? Okay, so that could be done. Too. Good enough. So I, I think that's the answer. Okay. Did we do a nod count? Yeah, I did a yeah. nod count. Nod we're count. good. Seven I just nods. did an informal no, nod count. No, we're no good. Nods. Yeah. Okay. Hey, what other subject matter? Sure, I wasn't sure. Doing this. That that's in there. It's a little quip in my staff report. Yes, I and, and we don't have to talk about this if you guys don't want to. And I know you talked about it before, but um, is there any interest in the possibility? <laughs> All right. Or if you want to make a decision tonight, that would be great too. But um, to go electronic with staff reports and filings rather than paper copies of everything and requiring as part of our regulations the electronic filing of applications the electronic filing of plans <laughs> um, and then you know the, the city would provide for tablets or laptops you know this, this is something we really want to get into the, the, the beauty of electronic is that you can zoom in, zoom out, um, and we save a lot of paper. Exactly. Oh, nice. So you give us a tablet? That we have three in on on file, in in storage, but we could we could definitely move in that direction. Um, in my previous position, um, everything was electronic. I, I honestly I don't even remember the last time I put a paper file together because it's all electronic um, and in we were still zooming actually <laughs> you know that's all coming to an end most likely unless they extend it again but um, uh, it, it it there's so many advantages to it for staff this advantages it once you get used to it for planning board members too you know, from my standpoint, if the city's going to provide me with a laptop to do this, then I'm all for it. Anybody else fighting? You don't have a problem? I'm, I'm good with that. I don't need a laptop or anything. Awesome. Wow. Um, and I'm already there. Because I hate paper with the burning passion. And, and I just have to say, since you've stopped paying the postage on it, you're no longer <laughs> contributing to my retirement, <laughs> so I don't care. I, I, I was in a meeting with Casey Friday, and, um, you know, the legislators, it was a legislative breakfast, and one of the things I said is that please help communities and stop with this notice requirement in newspapers. Um, what, number one, there aren't any newspapers. Nobody's reading them, you know, and to publish them is a real pain trying to find one. And they're $1,200 a, a publication cost now. It's not cheap. You know, not so much of a problem for the city of Woburn, but for a lot of these small communities, it's, it's crazy how much this stuff costs, and they don't have the money for it. So they agreed. I mean, there is a state statute now filed. It hasn't gone anywhere, but hopefully this year it does. And um, the alternative will be to post on town websites public hearing notices. Um, you know, most people do get their information now about what's going on um, in local government via the town website. Well, we just went through that. I'm on the board of electricians. Mm -hmm. We still have to make the paper available if somebody requests it. Yeah. 
Yeah, but um, you know, there's this serious movement finally. I know, but, but because somebody said, hey, just because I'm not part of the electronic world. Yeah. You know, so. Right. Okay, in front of you, you have draft minutes. Motion Last. to approve. Yeah. We have a motion. Second. Claudia Second. To approve the minutes. Second. Second by uh, Mike, I guess. Uh, all those in favor, seven, uh, <laughs> seven, four, none opposed. All right, so that would. Uh, in that part of it, and I like one more motion. I would make a motion to adjourn at 929. Second. Claudia, you adjourn 929. Second by Carolyn. All those in favor, 7 uh, yeah, I think we probably do have stuff to sign. So. All right. 